business. It's not in the program, not in the bulletin. This year, I'm pleased to announce that the number of people who were killed in this year has dropped for the first time in quite a while. So we only have, only have 31 this year. London Price, a black trans woman, was killed in Miami-Dade County, Florida on October 23rd. She was 26 years old. Lisa Love, a black trans woman, was killed in Chicago, Illinois on October 17th. She was 35 years old. Anae Johnson, a black trans woman, was killed in Washington, D.C. on October 14th. She was 30 years old. Dominic Dupree, also known as Dominic Palace, a black gender non-conforming person was killed in Chicago, Illinois on October 13th. They were 25 years old. China Long, a black trans woman, was killed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on October 8th. She was 30 years old. <clears throat> Yoko, also known as You Only Know One, a black non-binary, was killed in New Orleans, Louisiana, on September 19th. They were 30 years old. Sherlyn Marjorie, a Latina trans woman, was killed in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on September 17th. She was 35 years old. Kylie Minali, a trans woman, was killed in Marietta, California on September 7th. She was 41 years old. Luis Angel Diaz Castro, a Latina transgender man, was killed in San Juan, Puerto Rico on October 12th. He was 22 years old. Thomas Tom Tom Robertson, a black gender non-conforming person, was killed in Calumet City, Illinois, on August 17th. They were 28 years old. Devani Jeray Johnson, a black trans woman, was killed in Los Angeles, California, on August 7th. She was 28 years old. Jacob Williamson, a white trans man, was killed in Monroe, North Carolina, on June 30th. He was 18 years old. Chanel Perez Ortiz, a Latina trans woman, was killed in Carolina, Puerto Rico on June 25th. She was 29 years old. Asia Davis, Ashia Davis, a black trans woman, was killed in Detroit, Michigan on June 2nd. She was 34 years old. Banco Brown, a black trans man, was killed in San Francisco, California on April 27th, he was 24 years old. Rashida Coco Dadal Williams, a black trans woman, was killed in Atlanta, Georgia on April 18th. She was 35 years old. Ashley Burton, a black trans woman, was killed in Atlanta, Georgia on April 11th. She was 37 years old. Tasha Saya Woodland, a black trans woman, was killed in St. Mary's County, Maryland, on March 24th. She was 18 years old. Tortu Gito, an indigenous, queer, and non-binary individual, was killed in Atlanta, Georgia, on January 18th. They were 26 years old. Cache B. Henderson, a black trans woman, was killed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, on February 26th. She was 31 years old. Imano Witahozaki, a black trans woman, was killed in Louisville, Kentucky on February 3rd. She was 26 years old. Maria Fair, a Latina trans woman, was killed in Houston, Texas on January 21st. She was 22 years old. Jasmine Star Mack, a black trans woman was killed in Washington, D.C. on January 7th. She was 36 years old. Unique Banks, 
a Latina trans woman, was killed in Chicago, Illinois on January 23rd. She was 21 years old. Now we're going into 2022 because this runs from, Jan from November to November. Henry Berg Brousseau, a trans man, died in Arlington, Virginia on December 16th. He was 24 years old. Kaylee Lovelight, a Latina trans woman, was killed in Phoenix, Arizona on December 17th. She was 27 years old. Destiny Howard, a black trans woman, was killed in Macon, Georgia on December 9th. She was 23 years old. Marquise M.J. Jackson, a black trans man, was killed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on December 12th. He was 33 years old. Shahir J Diamond Jackson McDonald, a black trans woman, was killed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on November 24th. She was 27 years old. Daniel Aston, a white trans man, was killed in Colorado Springs, Colorado, on November 19th during the Club Q shooting. He was 28 years old. Kelly Loving, a white trans woman, was killed in Colorado Springs, Colorado, on November 19th during the Club Q shooting. She was 40 years old. It's a time in our service where we collect an offering. To those attending MCC Boston through our social media, you too can participate by going to our website at mccboston.org and clicking on the donate button there for that purpose. Thank you for being a part of our church family. Members and friends of MCC Boston, as many of you know, our church has been conducting a stewardship drive. This evening, that drive is coming to a close. If you haven't been able to complete a pledge card, know that you can submit one at any time. In making a pledge, you're basically stating that MCC Boston can count on you to help support our church family. But like all things, if situations change and you find you can no longer meet this obligation, we ask you simply submit a new pledge card or email the church treasurer with the change. Likewise, if you're blessed with additional prosperity, you too are encouraged to submit a new pledge card. This evening, we have more good news to share in that we received a total of seven pledges, reaching $11,180. Thank you to all who have completed your pledge card and have helped our ministry budget and income planning for 2024. As a way of demonstrating our progress, each week we've been updating our rainbow graphic by coloring in the area up to the amount previously pledged. Also, as is our custom here at MCC Boston, each week we've been highlighting colors of the rainbow with a story that emphasizes aspects of stewardship. This evening, our color is orange. Orange is the showy color, the color of great big stinky flowers and sweet fruit. It's the color most associated with the outlandish 1970s with its loud prints and bright orange shag carpets. While many aspects remind us to share our resources and ensure, uh, in essence, to be gardeners of one another, orange reminds us to be that big stinky flower, to strut our stuff and to step into the spotlight, and to be a good steward of the talents that God has gifted us with. We're reminded of this in Matthew 5.15. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Could you be hiding your lamp under the basket? Perhaps it's time to share your lamp so everyone can see. As we can see from our rainbow graphic, we fell just under our goal. This is really a great achievement considering the toll COVID has had on the size of our congregation. Your gifts of financial support will enable both MCC Boston and our denomination to better the world for queer folk everywhere. Your contribution of time will ensure that someone will, someone will be present to answer the door when our new queer sibling comes knocking. And your gift of talent will bless and transform the hearts and minds of our church family and visitors alike to the beauty of God's love. Your continued participation makes this possible. And through your commitment, MCC Boston and UFMCC is made stronger. 
So this week, give thanks for this, your church family, and for the presence of God's grace in all of our lives. For now, as the basket is presented, please give as you are able, and may God continue to bless you and MCC Boston. Thank you. There are no limits to the gifts you have given us, gracious God. Now we return thanks to you for these gifts, and we bring these tokens to you, asking for your blessing on the givers and the gifts. Help these gifts and givers to be your witnesses throughout the world. Amen. Our first reading this evening is from Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings, created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. God created them male and female. Second reading is Exodus 20, 2 through 5a. I am Yahweh, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth below, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator, and certain unalienable rights that among these are life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you didn't know, that was the United States Declaration of Independence. <laughs> Our final reading this evening is Matthew 22, 15 through 21. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarii. Then he said to them, Whose head is this? And whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. I know at least one of you recognizes that gospel scripture. 
It's always daunting to stand up here about to quote someone who is in the audience. In his letter from the Birmingham jail, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. This is an interesting statement for several reasons, each deserving its own exploration, but I'm not going to do that today. What did strike me most about it all is the call for anyone looking to create a better world to first engage in self-purification. I take this to indicate the importance of carefully crafting or carefully examining our values and motivations to ensure they support actions that can build a better world. Such work is difficult, and it's incumbent upon us to make sure that before we do anything, we think deeply about the first principles of our work, the values that underline all that we do. Are we truly acting on behalf of a better world for all, or are we looking to puff ourselves up? If we find ourselves alone in taking a position, have we thought deeply about enough about what we believe to be able to hold our convictions when the winds of controversy blow? Values help, our, help guide our efforts, providing a lens, a lens through which we view the world, helping us to determine the best way to use our information towards shaping better approaches to create a better world for all. Since we're sitting in a Christian church, perhaps the most important values we should cultivate are those that are given to us by our God. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. A few weeks ago, I was listening to someone else's sermon. Yeah, I never listened to my own. <clears throat> About the golden calf, when the impatient Israelites made while waiting for Moses' return from communing with God. As often happens, I wondered why God doesn't want images made, a commandment, I suppose, that arose specifically out of this event. It occurred to me that God is everything, infinite, ultimately expansive. There is nothing that can be made by humans to show that, no image can possibly express the wideness of God's existence. <coughs> How can God's own creations possibly depict their creator's glory? Idols and statues are merely the creation of human artistry and therefore inferior to humans. Humans can only truly worship by directing their thoughts to their creator. The second commandment condemns the devotion and worship that people give to religious images, icons, and statues. <clears throat> God teaches that human ideas of form cannot be applied to God. As Jesus told the woman at the well in Samaria, God is spirit, and those who worship God must worship in spirit and truth. Material representation of the divine can give only an inaccurate and imperfect idea of God's true magnificence and infinite character. Therefore, it demeans God to represent God's self with any artificial form. The prophet Isaiah quotes God, I am Yahweh, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, and my, nor my praise to idols. God does not share their glory with any idol or statue. God refuses to praise them. Only God is worthy of our praise. And yet, and yet, God has created an image of God's self. 
human beings. God created humanity to reflect God's own nature. When we oppress or abuse one another, we oppress and abuse God. When we kill one another, as these names represent, we kill God. The Declaration of Independence of this country states that God created humans with certain rights that cannot be denied. Yet we have here a list of people for whom life was taken away simply for living authentically. In today's gospel lesson, Jesus is being challenged by a group of religious leaders who are looking for excuses to disappear Jesus. They know he's popular amongst the people, so they're out to sully his image. The Pharisees and Herodians were well aware of Jesus' popularity, and they knew that they were asking Jesus a yes or no question, to which yes and no were both deadly answers. One leads to a charge of blasphemy, the other to a, de a direct confrontation with the Romans, which is never a good idea. Jesus, however, is a smart person and can see quite readily that a trap is being set. He even calls them out for their hypocrisy. He knows that both answers are wrong, so as he often does, Jesus gives a completely different answer, even answering with a question of his own. The image on the coin is that of Caesar and carries an inscription that he is a god. As Johnny Gall so eloquently preached recently, this leaves us with trying to understand what Jesus is saying the roles of God and state in our lives should be. And yes, it is properly footnoted. <clears throat> Here's my sticking point with it. By making a divided loyalties claim, by deciding that we have different loyalties to each, we are placing the state at the same level as God. We are saying that both rule over us in different ways and in different areas of our lives. But each is supposedly right to rule over us. And that may seem right to some, but I, that's Johnny, can't, just can't get there. Because I believe that God rules over every part of my life. Because I believe that I owe everything to God and that God is one and no other one rules beside her. As far as I see it, neatly dividing our responsibility in this way is the same as setting another ruler next to God and I will abide no other ruler. My obedience belongs to God and God only." Unquote. In the 13th chapter of Romans, Paul writes something similar to what Jesus is saying. Maybe. Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those authorities that exist have been instituted by God. He says that the state exists to target evildoers and not those that do good. We all know that the government is not so even-handed. As Johnny said again, we know that governments have done evil things to innocent people, to the indigenous people of this land and many lands, to innocent civilians of marginalized identities, to people who were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. We can also plainly see that the government freely acquits evildoers when it serves them. That it condones rampant bribery and actions which bring suffering to the general public, so long as those actions are being perpetrated by a certain class of people. And I might add, being perpetrated upon a certain class of people. Many of the people whose names appear on this list each year have been denied sufficient notice by the authorities to obtain justice. Even the media rarely follows up. 
Those in power don't find them, like Jesus, to be worthy of any attention other than disgust and dismissal. Mr. Gall argues against every case of divided loyalty between state and God. <clears throat> there is, I believe there's a link to that on our website somewhere. What if we're meant to recognize that that little coin with Caesar's face on it and some high words praising his being? What if we're just not meant to care about that coin at all? To recognize that the coin itself is one of the trappings of empire. So we don't care about giving it back to them. After all, what can that coin buy us anyway but prestige in a society that is passing away? A society we don't really care about being part of in the first place. Jesus does tell us elsewhere to be in the world, but not of the world. So what if the whole point in this conversation is to say that we're forced to live in places with governments because they have seized every inch of this planet and we should not needlessly grapple with them, but we should recognize that the things the state lusts after are of no concern of ours. It's a coin from the government, and the government can have it because it's not really all that important. Maybe we allow the government to do its government things, but we keep our minds and our hearts focused on God. Maybe by saying, why do you test me? Jesus is also saying, why do you waste my time with the trivialities of this shallow earthly kingdom when I am about the work of, the, of God's kingdom in the world, which one day will eclipse all of the petty concerns of your government, just as surely as that coin will one day dissolve into dust. I think it's no coincidence that Jesus asks, whose image does this coin bear? The coin bears Caesar's image. So the coin belongs to Caesar. And what bears God's image? We do, all of us, together. We belong to God, wholly, inseparably, no matter how much any ruling power may claim authority over us or over others. That's a value worth viewing the world with. And so we focus not on keeping to ourselves a bunch of meaningless coins with the face of a man we'll never meet. We focus on giving ourselves to God. We focus on bringing God's people back to the divine. We focus on showing them the love that will draw them to God. And we show them that love extends to even those they don't understand. For we are all God's children, made in God's image. The only earthly image that can even remotely resemble God is the human character, when it is transformed into the design likeness as it was originally created. As Paul wrote, those who have clothed yourselves with the new self which is being renewed in care and knowledge according to the image of his creator. God's character can be reproduced in the believer's lives by looking to God. All of us, with unveiled, unveiled faces, seeing the glory of God as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from God, the Spirit. Thus our lives become like mirrors, receiving life from God and reflecting it to and onto others. Whose image do you bear?